Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President and CEO Expedia Group, Mark Okerstrom, in discussion with Skift Executive Editor, Founding Editor, Dennis Schall. Morning, everybody. Morning, Mark. Good morning, Thanks. Dennis. Thanks for being here. Great to be here. Please don't forget to put your questions into the app or slido.com for Mark at the, end of the, for the, at the end of the session. So Mark, thanks so much. You made a lot of news this week and we like news. Trying to keep things interesting for That's you. That's it. Timing is everything. Keeping it real. So um, the first one is uh, really an industry first. Um, and that is you made a deal with Marriott. Yes. Marriott and Expedia made a deal um, that for bed banks, tour operators who want to access Marriott's wholesale rates, they have to go through, unless they have a direct connection with Marriott, they have to go through yeah. Expedia. So can you um, explain more about the deal, how it came yeah. about, and what it means? Sure. Um, listen, I think that the, the deal, first of all, we're incredibly excited about it, and we are very pleased with our growing uh, relationship with Marriott. They really have been a great partner for many years, and I think this is a great example of what happens when you get two parties together who spend time not fighting with one another, but actually thinking about the art of the possible and where we can create value together. Uh, you know, Marriott had, as, as many hospitality companies have, uh, challenges sometimes ensuring that their rates and availability are actually put out into the market in a way where customers completely understand what they're getting and that things are distributed in a way that those hospitality companies want them to be. And I think we have built an incredible network of relationships and API connections with hundreds of thousands of travel agents and tens of thousands of other affiliates uh, around the world. And it enables us to be in a unique position to be able to help Marriott uh, ultimately ensure that their rates and availability are distributed in a way where customers know exactly what they're going to get and that, that policies are complied with. And I think uh, it's, it's pretty exciting. It's a first in the industry. And we're looking forward to helping Marriott achieve their objectives. So when we see what I call rogue rates, you know, wholesale rates that are out there that aren't supposed to be out there on Kayak or even Trivago, yeah. um, who's going to make sure that um, those players are doing the right yeah. thing? Well, I think we have had uh, this incredible business called Expedia, Expedia Partner Solutions uh, for many years and have been powering, like I said, offline travel agents, uh, other OTAs, big banks like American Express, uh, JP Morgan Chase, for example. And that team has developed pretty sophisticated technology to ensure that ultimately rates and inventory are used in the way that they are supposed to be used. So we will be using that technology to ensure compliance like we always have for all of our partners. Uh, I suspect Marriott will also be doing their part to ensure compliance and together we'll make sure that things are presented to consumers in the right way. So Marriott's going to have this roadside, road sign and it says, go to Expedia if you want to get our rates. What's involved in this, uh, these companies establishing a, a relationship with Expedia? Well, Expedia's got a huge sales force out there. We've got a big open for sale business. Uh, Is it going to be a, a large cost for them to do that? or? A lar no, I, I think we've built, again, we've built this incredible network and we've got a great sales force and account management team that's always looking for new, uh, new relationships. And I think, importantly, we've got relationships and connectivities with many of these partners already. So I don't think okay. it'll be a huge extra lift. It's really leveraging, in most respects, the platform that we've already built. Okay. Uh, the other piece of news is uh, United and Expedia uh, came to terms. Contract was due to expire September 30th. Yeah. Armageddon avoided. <laughs> So, uh, anything new in this deal, new or interesting? I noticed there was a, a one-liner at the end of the uh, announcement, the joint announcement saying that the two parties will work to expand cooperation in the near future. Is that a throwaway line or is there something there? <laughs> well, again, I think this is another great example that's similar to the way that Marriott and us approached our relationship. You know, with United, we got together with them. We said, listen, there's so many ways that we can work together. And instead of having discussions around us versus you, 
dividing the pie. Let's have a conversation that says, how can we actually expand the ways we work together such that you're better off from this deal and we're better off from this deal. And that's what this deal represents. It's a broad deal. It covers our leisure business, our corporate travel business, our Expedia partner solutions business, our media business. And we're going to continue to look for ways that we can expand that partnership, again, in ways that are win-win. It wasn't always peaches and cream, though, leading up to this. Um, there was a court fight. Uh, United said, we don't really need Expedia in this new era. We have our mobile app. We have direct traffic. Yeah. But it came to be. It came to be. It came to be. And I think, again, I think this industry is moving on and has been evolving over the course of the last number of years. In the early days of the internet, I think there was a question as to whether these online travel agencies were going to survive. And there was a lot of contention between the airlines and the OTAs. And I think the world has moved on. Expedia is here, we are a large player, we do some things incredibly well, but we don't run airlines very well. <laughs> and so... I'm gonna leave that to them. Yes, and okay. so there's a real opportunity for us to get together. They have together. their challenges with that too. Well, of course, <laughs> it's a very difficult business, yeah. and, and our business is very difficult. And so, again, I think with the United relationship, things have moved on, and now we can say, listen, let's be great partners, here's what we're great at, here's what you're great at, and let's showcase your strengths on our platform, and let's help you achieve your objectives. On a smaller scale, there's another little bit of news that uh, I got a tip about yesterday, and that was that um, Expedia acquired Silver Rail, the, the, um, yeah. it's almost a rail GDS, for 148 million in 2017, and I hear that you recently, and I guess you were offering rail to consumers in Europe? And that part of the business has been shut down, and uh, Silver Rail is still doing you know, back-end work with yeah. the train. So what happened with that? Well, Silver Rail's been around for uh, many, many years, and over the course of those many years has done a bunch of experiments, like we do across Expedia Group, to develop new products and, te and technologies. Uh, they've had uh, consumer-facing applications like one called uh, Qno that they've launched and then pulled back. Uh, I think that's something that we're going to continue to see. We'll see that at Silver Rail. We'll see that across Expedia Group. We try things. If they don't get the traction uh, that we want, you know, we'll pull them back and put our resources where uh, where it matters. Silver Rail is doing really well. Silver Rail is powering Agencia, our corporate travel business, is ramping up transaction volume uh, there and is looking to expand relationships with other partners around the industry. They've really built a tremendous platform for rail connectivity in what has been a very, very messy space from a connectivity standpoint. Great. Uh, let's go to the slide. Please, let's go to the slide. Okay, <laughs> here we go. <clears throat> Uh, Airbnb overtook Expedia in room nights in yeah. Q1 2019. Yeah. So that's a pretty big development. Actually, the slide is slightly out of date because um, it was based on Q1 numbers from Airbnb or from the Wall Street Journal about Airbnb. But Airbnb uh, came out with some financials yesterday for the second quarter saying they did a million dollars in revenue. Uh, they wouldn't tell me how much room nights they did. So um, this is kind of the room night thing, though, is kind of a milestone watershed yeah. event, no? Yeah, I think so. Listen, Airbnb has built a great business. I have nothing but respect for what they have done. They really ultimately created a whole new category that was accessible online. It was a challenge that we had seen for many, many years, and we've been the alternative accommodation space from before Airbnb was, was actually a, a word, but getting the connectivity, getting things transacting online was a challenge. Uh, they've done it, and they built a, a solid business. Uh, I think as it relates to their room night volume, uh, I think it is. I think it's a great milestone, but I think it's a hallmark for how big this space can be in the overall industry. Uh, we're pretty excited about Verbo. Um, what do you think of the name, that's gonna be, that's What do you gonna think be... of the name? You have to tell me, honestly. Or the logo, just, okay, now don't, don't tell me what you really think of the name. I see you hesitating. <laughs> Mark, I, I love that logo. <laughs> Thank you, the logo's great. But the listen. name, eh. but, <laughs> but no, listen, Verbo. No, but you did, you, you did uh, what do you call it, uh, panels, and, and you, felt, you found that, uh, consumer panels, and you found that people responded yeah, to Yeah, absolutely, around the, around the world. Uh, 
you know, Verbo's made incredible progress over the course of the last four years, and I think it's a testament to how big this category uh, can be. We've brought that inventory now on to Expedia and Hotels.com, which is going to open up the urban and international markets uh, for the alternative accommodation space across those brands. Hats off to Airbnb. Uh, I think alternative accommodations in total is, is here to stay and is an exciting growth area. We were talking backstage about how travel generally isn't a winner-take-all market, uh, although a lot of people think it is. They think, okay, Airbnb is killing it, no one else can make it. There'll be, there'll be a few players. But you've been having problems with Verbo. Um, when, when you changed the name from VRBO and HomeAway to Verbo, um, you had some SEO problems with Google. Uh, growth has been slowing. You're trying to go international. You're trying to get you know, more urban. Um, as Yogi Berra might have said, and Yogi Berra was um, quoted yesterday as well uh, by Avis Budget, it's getting late early now. <laughs> Listen, I, again, I think we've got to look at this in the, in the broader context. We acquired HomeAway VRBO at the time in late 2015. Uh, at the time, it was doing about $3 billion or so in online bookings, about $500 million in revenue, about $120 million in EBITDA and profit, and, and trailing 12 months, I mean, those numbers are approaching $12 billion in bookings, over a $1 billion in revenue, you know, close to $300 million in adjusted EBITDA. And if you look at where the product has come, the traveler experience is infinitely better than it was before. The partner-facing experience is infinitely better than it, uh, than it was before. We've integrated a lot of this inventory onto Expedia and Hotels.com. The progress has been phenomenal. Now, as we rebranded Verbo, as we consolidated platforms, there were some bumps in the road in terms of just the SEO volume that you mentioned, a shifting marketing spend away from some of these legacy or regional brands towards the Verbo brand. That did put some pressure on bookings growth across the whole portfolio. But the Verbo brand is growing you know, nicely in the double digits. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think if we look back five years from now and we say, uh, you know, what was that? I think we'd say that was just a bump in the road. It's a blip and, and Verbo's you know, continuing to thrive. I could be wrong, but sometimes I think like Verbo and Airbnb are in two different businesses. You know, it, when I think of Airbnb, I think of, you know, student backpackers. Yeah. I mean, you know, and Verbo is more families and groups and, and older people. Is that an issue? I don't think it's an issue. I think it's just a reality. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at what Verbo's strengths are, it's whole homes, usually large homes. I mean, their average booking is usually two rooms plus, you know, larger parties. They've got incredible inventory there. That inventory is often very hard to get access to, so they've got a lot of inventory that's just Verbo-only inventory. They do friends and family incredibly well, and they're doing a ton of innovation in this space in terms of uh, just the ability to collaborate using things called trip boards where you can post a particular property or set of properties that you're interested in and engage with your travel mates around choosing the right property. Uh, I think it's a huge opportunity for them uh, to really do friends and family well. And I think if you look at the travel industry and if anyone has tried to book hotel rooms or anything else for large groups, it's difficult. Verbo is cracking that. I think they're uniquely positioned to do it. I think the Airbnb model of having very affordable places in urban centers is also an exciting opportunity. But as you call out, it's just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So now Google is uh, getting into vacation rentals. Who? Uh, Google. Okay. Um, and you, you've been very outspoken last year saying uh, that you thought Google was the biggest com competitive threat uh, to your business. So what does it mean um, that Google is, is now yeah. doing vacation rentals. Um, yeah. Is that going to be a big challenge eventually? Well, listen, I think let's, let's reframe it. I think as it relates to a certain aspect of our business, helping shoppers choose where they want to go, Google is competitive with us in that respect. As it relates to actually completing the booking and then helping customers with their trip along the way, that is what we do you know, uniquely well. And that's not a space that Google is, is really participating. You know, again, we're not a search engine in total. We're an online travel agent. And we're very focused on putting the A 
agent back in travel agency and really helping travelers with their journey. But yes, as it relates to search, uh, Google is, uh, is a competitor with us and it's a call to arms to our teams to make sure that we can actually get out there and help customers find their, their perfect trip. Uh, but remember, Google is also a great partner to ours. We continue to push our boundaries inter internationally, and Google is absolutely key to that. As it relates to vacation rentals, listen, Google is trying to make sure that they've got a great search experience across all verticals. And alternative accommodations is a, as we talked about earlier, a big and growing place. Uh, it doesn't surprise us that they're in that space, but again, they're in the search side of things, and mm -hmm. there's so much more uh, to this industry uh, that, that we do. Google has gotten the attention of regulators, antitrust regulators. The, the DOJ is reportedly looking into their business. State attorney generals uh, are looking at, uh, at Google. You want to make any news? I mean, do you have <laughs> any of those people on speed dial? Have, have they approached you? Are you talking to them? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, listen, you quoted Yogi Berra. Let me quote Spider-Man, which is with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> so I think, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, in some cases, it's just appropriate for governments to just make sure that everything is uh, above board and that, that dominant positions aren't being abused. Sure. Um, resort fees. Yes. Booking Holdings decided to ch start charging commissions on resort fees. They've actually started outside the United States. Um, in the, the U.S., they're going to be charging those commissions starting January 1st, they say. Expedia left them out on a limb with the hotel industry because Expedia uh, did not match that initiative. So yeah. what was your thinking, and have you um, taken any action at all on resort fees? Yeah. Well, listen, I don't know about leaving them out on the limb. I didn't, we didn't even know there was a tree that they were climbing. There, there is a tree. Uh, there is a tree. Uh, Listen, I, I think what we're most interested in is that consumers ultimately know what they're getting into. They know what they have to pay. They know the value that they're getting for what they pay. Uh, we have been very clear that we're ensuring and we want to ensure that our partners have very clear disclosure around what fees are payable what f up front, which ones are uh, payable at the property, our search results uh, ranking algorithm takes into account compliance with that requirement. It takes into account the fact that there so are... So some fees. of those hotels will be plunging in your search results? Well, if, listen, to, to the extent that hotels aren't transparent or that there are excessive fees, that is something that the algorithm takes uh, into account. And again, that's our approach to trying to make sure that we are protecting consumers and we're making sure that our customers know exactly what they're getting into. And that's our primary concern. One of the themes of our conference is travel's responsibility to the world. Uh, how do you view that in terms of uh, climate change or over tourism? Yeah. What can an Expedia do? Well, I think let's start with this, which is travel is a force for good, uh, particularly in today's day and age where, you know, listen, the promise of these devices was to bring us closer together, but in fact, you know, it seems to have polarized us. And travel, goes around that. Travel connects us physically, emotionally, not on the device on a, on a screen, but on the real world. And so as we look at uh, the good that travel brings to the world, I think as we think about sustainability, which uh, is totally top of mind for us as well, we can't demonize the greatness that travel is. Uh, as it relates to sustainability, we have an obligation. Honestly, everyone on the planet has an obligation to do what they can to make sure that this great earth of ours is preserved. And these, these incredible sites around the world exist in great shape for other people to uh, experience. So, you know, whether it is getting involved like we have been in, in with various countries in Southeast Asia in terms of helping police the use of single-use plastics, whether it's helping uh, countries like Britain or France, just to name a few, make sure that travelers actually know that there are other places to go aside from just these popular sites. Uh, we're doing a ton of things uh, to, to make sure that we are doing what we can as you know, the world's travel platform to ensure that travel remains vibrant, but it does so in a way that ultimately preserves this planet and makes sure that it's here for travelers to experience for many years to come. Uh, Delta CEO Ed Bastian yesterday said that um, he feels like the, the public, I guess in the U.S. he was talking about, is looking to CEOs of corporations rather than governments uh, for moral leadership on social issues. Mm -hmm. What do you feel your role is to speak out on some of these things? Yeah. 
Well, I think that as leaders, we have a responsibility to step up and be visible on issues. The caveat is, is if you look at this world, there are many, many issues. And so, as a CEO, I think it's very important to be very clear about what are your personal convictions, what are your personal beliefs, and where are you going to engage the company in terms of voicing opinions on issues. Uh, we have come out on many issues uh, that have been important to Expedia Group or Expedia Group The employees. travel ban, for example. Exactly, yeah. and I think that's the place where we're gonna continue to be visible and, as a company, uh, issues around sustainability, travel restrictions, et cetera. Uh, and on the rest of the issues, I may do things that uh, ultimately put myself out there on a personal level and issues that I'm concerned about, but we do have to be very careful with where we put the Expedia Group name and put it in places that are relevant to Expedia Group. We asked Steve Kaufer yesterday if he's concerned about CEO pay. He said he is, but actually it's not one of the issues he's really working hard on. How do you <laughs> feel about that? <laughs> well, you know, obviously that's a, a sticky topic. I think that um, ultimately CEOs are paid at market rates and there's a market available for uh, their services and that's what ultimately dictates it. Do I look at CEO pay and compare it to the pay of teachers and the pay of policemen and the pay of many of the people that keep this great country of ours moving along by investing in healthcare and investing in the future of our children and do I say that that looks a little bit out of whack. Absolutely, how, you know, how could you not? But at the same time, I look at pro athletes, I look at movie stars in the same vein. Uh, I'm optimistic and I'm hopeful that we will find a world of the future that has more equal wealth distribution. Uh, it doesn't seem to be the case right now. Uh, we sort of an uh, answered the question, Mark, uh, about Verbo before, so I'll go on up to the next one. Uh, Future of travel, what is the coolest next thing we should expect from Expedia? Come on, you saw the Marriott deal, isn't that cool and an exciting thing? That's like inside baseball <laughs> cool. You're right. Um, Consumer you listen, facing yeah, cool maybe. It's, listen, I think that uh, AI is, is you know, changing everything. Honestly, the, the amount of data that we have, the amount of travel activity that we see, both in terms of shopping activity and booking activity. I mean, north of $100 billion in, in gross bookings uh, last year. You think about the shopping activity that must happen to generate that type of booking. That type of data combined with the elastic compute power that the cloud is providing just allows us to do incredible things. And I think we are just seeing the early days of it, whether it's using machine learning and AI to power chatbots, whether it's creating experiences that are much more personalized and adaptive where we can say, Dennis, how was your trip? And we can pick you out amongst the 750 million visits that hit Expedia Group websites every single month. I think we're at the very early stages of this. Uh, again, we've been working with uh, Amazon and Alexa skills. I think all of these applications of AI and machine learning are gonna really open up a huge opportunity for us in the future. So one topic that's been around for a few years actually is multi-day tours. You've got all these big tour operators out there offering tours, and the OTAs don't really seem to be buying into it. Um, is that day coming? Well, listen, I think it's, it's something that we do do right now, whether it's through our Expedia cruise ship centers, retail uh, uh, outlet retail footprint where people can walk in there and talk about cruises, but also talk about multi-day uh, multi-day tours. Uh, you can see some of that on our in our activities business uh, right now. Uh, the issue with these things is that there are many cases very considered purchases. They're very uh, in many cases big ticket purchases. And in many cases, people want to actually talk to a human before they they book that. Mm -hmm. And so that's been one of the things that has ultimately uh, been a barrier to moving these types of things online in the way that airline tickets and uh, two-night hotel stay has. But listen, but like, like everything. A, you do yeah, have a large, um, large call centers and, yep. and stuff like that. Yeah, and we do, again, we do offer some of these types of things, um, but again, as a percentage of our overall $100 billion business, uh, it's not big enough yet to, to, to really move the needle. 
There was a question up there before, it kind of evaporated, but um, everyone's talking about China. Yes. Uh, you guys kind of, uh, you didn't totally exit China, but you, uh, you sold Elong. Yeah. Uh, so any chance of going back into China, or what's, what's the next big, uh, you know, Indonesia? What, yeah. Where are you going, Mark? Yeah, <laughs> listen, we're going, we're going all over the world, and, and we are absolutely involved in everything that is happening in China right now. What we did do is focused our strategy, and we said, listen, as it relates to the domestic Chinese market, as it compares to all of the other great markets around the world, that's not a place where we're gonna invest our resources. There are many incredible competitors there and, and great players, including Ctrip, of course, and Meituan and, and other players. And we're gonna let them do their thing, and it's not like we're letting them, they're doing their thing and doing it very well. Right. But we are very involved in outbound Chinese travel, powering offline travel agents, online uh, travel agents, and inbound Chinese travelers, taking people from other places in Asia and taking them to China. That's been the focus of our strategy. Are we in Indonesia? Absolutely, we're investor in Traveloka. We're right. there with our own brands. Uh, I think there's tons of opportunity for us around the world going forward. Great, Mark, this has been great. We, unfortunately, we have to be outbound now. Let's get going. They're kicking us off. All right, thanks, Dennis. Thanks a lot. Right. Thank you.